Hello, everybody. It's uh, Richard and myself today, Friday, um, June 25th, for our lunch in Bern. Um, a very interesting topic is coming up. Richard has done an enormous amount of work um, going through, fighting his way through the most recent research. And the topic is um, reinforcement via um, training methods which is proportional. So he will talk about what is uh, what came up here. It's a informal presentation today. So you will be unmuted and Richard invites you to ask questions and uh, be part of the show here um, whenever you're ready. Richard, um, please tell us when you're ready to- um, Thanks, uh, Warren. Uh, but, yeah, when you have time. Yeah, unmuted yeah, I'm just about got everybody unmuted at this point all right okay. i think we've we've i think we've got it okay we've got it good deal okay let's get started um this is a um been a controversial topic for some time in the in the field of neurofeedback um and uh, it still is to some degree um there are people like Strel who continue to, um, from Europe, uh, often involved in slow cortical potential, but <clears throat> um, her investigations are really well done uh, and her overviews are excellent. Um, uh, she's unsure of it. Uh, I'm not, but she's a researcher and I'm a clinician with 25 years of experience trying every damn thing you can think of to get people to change the brainwave pattern in a consistent uh, and recorded fashion, and I've kept notes the whole time. Um, and uh, so I have a different opinion, and there are other people who agree with me, quite a few in the field of neurofeedback, but we still have people who don't agree uh, about optim what's optimal for reinforcement and for uh, operant conditioning and for training and neurofeedback. Now in New Mind, we favor a modality called uh, um, uh, involuntary video reinforcement and um, that is a, a specific approach to operant conditioning and uh, changing brain waves, which is a learning process now my background is that um, I, I got my undergraduate degree in psychology my graduate degree in social psychology and I taught behavioral modification at the graduate level along with statistics and research methods. So I'm not unfamiliar with the theories for um, operant conditioning, which go back for 100 years, back to the 1920s when operant conditioning first emerged uh, in the field of psychology uh, by Watson, who got, interestingly enough, um, got caught uh, in uh, affairs at the university and got sent packing and went to um, Madison Avenue and started modern advertising, which is why modern advertising is so effective. It's based upon operant conditioning theory. And uh, uh, it's a very effective methodology and there are rules to it. And those rules go back uh, decades and decades. Um, you've probably heard of Skinner, B.F. Skinner, and the Skinner box, and Skinner was one of the uh, most prominent uh, uh, ex uh, experimenters and theorists in operant conditioning theory, and uh, um, it wasn't until the 1960s that psychology actually started to move beyond just operant conditioning as the main theory. So you had a lot of money, government, military, universities, and uh, Madison Avenue investing in operant conditioning theory. Uh, it's one of the most thoroughly investigated paradigms out there. It's established science. There's not a lot new going on in the fundamentals of operant conditioning. Uh, so um, my problem is, is that a lot of times when I read some of this stuff, I don't get the feeling that the people who are commenting on it have actually studied operant conditioning in detail um, and it's like statistics it's not the most fun thing in the world it's very mathematical it's very 
uh, involved with um, axioms and logic and um, deductive processes. Um, and it's very scientific and very control group design oriented. And that, a lot of people in psychology tend to want to go and look at the uh, clinical stuff, personality theory, and not the hard stuff. Uh, both are important, and that's what we've learned uh, in the second half of the 20th century and continue to learn. And uh, so that's important for what we're considering. Um, a lot of the people who make these statements also are engineers or programmers who have no background in behavior modification. Um, there's a few that do, but they're not very common. Um, and they have very distorted views. Um, a lot of the researchers seem to read articles on it, but they don't seem to understand the fundamentals. So this can be very frustrating. Uh, I watched people um, train for years. And knowing operant conditioning theory, I applied it in the clinical setting very um, specifically. And I monitored and used those rules and theories to train people. And it became very evident uh, over time that there were specific principles at work um, as I took notes and that um, uh, these uh, principles were fairly universal. There's exceptions, obviously. And uh, they have progressively been confirmed at the experimental level. Some of them already were confirmed, and I knew a lot of it or would be because it was already confirmed in learning theory. So it was inevitable that it would show up here eventually. So let's look at some of the research that's come up that supports the use of the type of uh, reinforcement that we use at NewMind and why, why we use it. And that it's not just an opinion, you know, from a, uh, somebody who's just been doing some training for a couple of years in neurofeedback, or somebody went to a workshop and heard something, or somebody who thought they saw something but had no training in theoretical uh, background of operant conditioning, who didn't understand the principles to apply them, or the dozens of other biases that emerge from um, uh, forming an opinion without enough facts and enough careful thought. So we're going to put together some uh, research, some facts, and some careful thought here and look at reinforcement. Um, and I'd like to start with visual feedback. Um, we have research, control group design, good research, uh, showing that visual feedback is superior to auditory feedback. Now, here are the two major um, pieces of research behind that. Uh, but that's not um, just in our field. If you look at the field of um, operant conditioning, you'll find that all of this is echoed. And what I see is, um, and I won't mention names, but I see different authors um, slowly pulling data from that field and not always knowing where to look or what research to look at and not getting a really good overview of it. But it shouldn't be a surprise if you've studied operant conditioning theory from the 20th century that um, in many cases, visual feedback is superior to audio, auditory feedback for human beings, not for all animals but for human beings. Um, and if your um, visual processing is poor, well, then certainly auditory is going to, you know, there's a caveat, auditory is going to become more, more prominent as an effective feedback. So it's not black and white. Uh, depending on people's disorders, it may vary between visual and auditory. Um, so that's a very important consideration. I see people who uh, insist on running visual and auditory at the same time. 
Now, if you have somebody without any sensory integration problems who's fairly healthy, that'll work out okay as long as it's not too extreme. Now, there's an assumption that if you have a visual, you've either got to have um, everything black or everything visual. And that's simply not true, and there's no support for that belief. If you believe that people either have to have nothing on the screen, it's all got to be all black, or it's got to be all seeing, you don't understand perceptual processing, psychophysics, or operant conditioning. You're just making uh, an observation that involves confirmation bias. You need to know there's nothing to support your opinion in this case. And if you can find something, I'd love to see it, actually. Because in science, everything is um, temporary. It's our best guess that we're probably not wrong based on the evidence we have at hand. Um, and that's Karl Popper, was kind of the person who defined that for scientific methodology. Um, so we like visual feedback predominantly. You can add auditory. And sometimes, with certain individuals, it will enhance it. And there are people who may, at certain times, do better with auditory feedback only. And there's situations where that's superior, like in alpha theta. And sometimes relaxation methodologies, auditory feedback, uh, you need that for eyes closed. You can't do eyes closed training with visual feedback. I mean, because they got their eyes closed. So obviously, auditory is going to be superior at that point. Um, and uh, so it's not black and white. But most of the uh, standard two-channel eyes open stuff, visual feedback is going to work the best. You don't want to have everything black and white. By the same token, you don't want to have auditory no tone um, to really loud tone. Um, that's too extreme. You don't need those extremes. The human sensory system is way more sensitive to that. What's insensitive is your um, attentional system. Your brain's taking in everything around you all the time. You're making selections which are blocking everything out, and you're doing it based upon your uh, environment, your training, your upbringing, and everything else. So attention is selective, particularly conscious attention. So if we're consciously attending, we're not paying attention to a lot of other things if we're attending to one thing. But our brain is taking in everything. And how transparent um, that boundary is varies a lot with people. So in general, for two-channel eyes open training, visual feedback will usually be superior. Proportional feedback is superior to binary. Here's Travis et al. Kiesel, 1992, if you don't like that idea, you're going to have to go do research that undermines this research. In other words, replicate what they've done and prove that they did it wrong. Until then, this stands as the best guess that we're probably not wrong about this. And there's a lot of good reasons, and there's been massive libraries written on this topic that we don't know about neurofeedback because that's you know, neurophysics is not our field. But if you go into uh, neuropsychology, neurophysics, you'll find um, that this is the case, that this is actually how the real world is. In the real world, we're usually not getting information of this is good, this is bad. We're getting degrees of information at all times. So the light and the auditory input to your brain is constantly varying. And, uh, continuous. Yes, Martin. Um, I just, sorry for the interruption here, but I find for those of, of us who are new in the field to make uh, to make very clear what proportional feedback is versus binary in a quick explanation. Yes. That would yes. be very helpful at this point. Great, great point, Martin. Great point. Um, binary is uh, when you have a set threshold and there's no tone or nothing on the screen. Um, uh, and then you get above threshold and then there's a tone and something shows up on the screen or you get a reinforcement is actually what we're getting to is that there's no reinforcement and then suddenly there's a reinforcement. 
it's either on or off. Uh, proportional feedback is different. There's degrees of reinforcement, and the reinforcement increases uh, the more effectively you perform a task or it decreases. So it's continuous. Uh, that's why we have a screen called proportional training screen, which gives you continuous tones going up and down. Um, when you're looking at the video, on uh, if you're using NewMind equipment, you're seeing the video get dark and light. It's doing that in direct proportion to the degree to which you approach the threshold and the degree to which you exceed the threshold. We're the only ones that do that. Everybody else, um, and we've tested their software, uh, what they do is that you make, you get above threshold, and then there's a gradual delay as the screen gets bright. And then as you go, go below threshold, there's a gradual delay as it gets dark. That gives um, a degree of proportional, or at least the appearance of proportional, but it's technically not proportional. And people who have gone from those other platforms to ours have often remarked how much faster people seem to respond. And two of the main reasons is we have auto artifacting, so they're mostly responding to real quality neurofeedback. And the second thing is that our video is actually real proportional. And uh, we can demonstrate that empirically uh, and technically at any time because we've done it in the past, but I'm not interested in uh, making a big deal out of it. That's the problem of the other people with their uh, software approach. I will say thought technology was the first, uh, along with Herschel Tumum, to um, offer proportional feedback. Most people didn't understand it or use it, but they had one of the most sophisticated proportional feedback um, software out there, and they probably still do if you can find it in there. Um, they stopped giving me uh, access to it when they shifted over uh, a while back to uh, Infinity, but I think they made adjustments so it could um, so that you could get to it again. I talked to Hal, who owns the company, and he assured me that they had made that possible again. Um, so kudos to them. Uh, and that's why we use it, um, but they never had it. Um, well, you could do a, a flower opening and get proportional feedback out of Thought Tech. So again, they really focused on this. They were really sharp about it, um, but they read Travis and uh, they knew that. So proportional feedback is superior to binary. Secondarily, feedback should be as immediate as possible. Well, if you're doing dichotomous, feedback or um, binary uh, feedback. There's a couple of terms for it. They call it discrete dichotomous um, or binary. I mean, this are all terms mean the same thing. Um, if you're doing that, you're waiting for a delay of at least a 500 milliseconds. And in a lot of cases, uh, the delay will go to a second or longer. It all depends upon the averaging. Uh, now, in neurofeedback, the standard is is that you have to meet criteria for 500 milliseconds, half a second, in order to get a tone or a change in the screen. And that came out of research. That's not something somebody just made up. That's And that's based upon um, our reaction time. Most people have a 300 millisecond response time. Athletes, sometimes 250. Uh, pilots are very fast responders, too. Um, Thank goodness. Uh, so there are occupations that attract these people as well, besides sports. But um, proportional feedback is giving you constant increments all the time, as fast as you could take them in. And so you don't have to wait. If you've got discrete, you may not make criteria for a couple of seconds, and then you'll get a tone. And then you won't hear one again, maybe for 10 or 15 seconds in some case, and then you'll get a tone. Proportional, you're always getting a tone constantly, every 500 milliseconds. And you can make that shorter, depending on the person, or a little longer. So it's helpful to find their sweet spots. So if you're using the proportional screen, um, we, we have it set up for a general 
optimum, but you can adjust uh, the averaging uh, and the rate at which people get the tone uh, so it's more optimal for them. But that's an advanced technique, and as I said last lunch you learn, you don't have to know proportional. Uh, it's an advanced technique that you learn to use eventually that when other things aren't working out, you know, you can adapt, like coherence training. So uh, another effective tool in your toolbox. So that's why uh, a proportional is so powerful, because it's as immediate and it's constant. Um, there are long articles about this, and I've written one myself that's in uh, coming out in the book, Doing Neurofeedback, our new version coming out in the coming weeks that Rob and I did when we updated it. I went into great detail and worked with John Frederick, who's also published on that topic. Uh, and we went back and forth because we don't totally agree on it. Uh, so that forced a very detailed chapter on the topic. Um, so that'll be available. And then I'll publish more on this on New Mind Journal in the coming months. Okay, effective feedback need not be voluntary. This is a huge problem in our field. People in neurofeedback did not know about the psychology of learning. A lot of the people were even psychologists themselves. Uh, they weren't behavioral mod experts. Some of them were behavioral mod experts. But the concept of involuntary learning didn't really emerge until the 70s and the 80s, and it slowly gradu gradually gained momentum. Uh, there was a real bias in the sciences against the concept, particularly in psychology and all the other sciences, that there was no such thing as the unconscious, that that was a fiction. It was like, there's no such thing as lucid dreaming. That's a fiction because it didn't fit the paradigm at the time, and people are very often black and white and overly rigid in their thinking instead of seeing their um, their postulates and their hypotheses and conclusions as a tentative, they see them as fixed and eternal and so consequently turn science into scientism, a religion. And that ultimately slows down um, new research, new insights, and then every once in a while we have a revolution in science because it gets so bad that somebody actually comes up with something that's a game changer that's irrefutable um, for the time being. So uh, this is the big one. There's so many people out there who think that you have to consciously make an effort to learn. And that's no longer supported in research. Not supported at all. There's so much research that that contradicts that, it's a foolish notion to even maintain at this point. So that applies to biofeedback and neurofeedback. Involuntary learning is a very real thing that we do all the time. It's measurable. It's in, You can investigate it and you can uh, learn about it. And there's whole books written on this topic. Um, some very good authors. So you can do neurofeedback that's voluntary, yes but you can also do neurofeedback that's um, involuntary. And that's very important. And Beer Bomber actually did research with a fMRI feedback to confirm that fact. And not only that, he located the areas of the brain that were most active during the neurofeedback process of learning, which was great. And he isolated those areas to be the basal ganglia. and he identified um, uh, that it wasn't explicit learning, but it was implicit learning uh, that he was finding to be highly effective and argued that it was very effective. Um, so that's very important. So when you add this all up, it, you come to a conclusion. Did somebody have a comment they wanted to make? Oh yeah, I was just curious. Does that mean that the client doesn't need to know, um, doesn't need to understand the reward structure of the of the reward? Like what is reward and what is not? You do all just work that time. I am very sorry. Your um, audio is so distorted. I wasn't able to make out what you're saying. Did anybody? Was anybody able to make sense of that? No, I didn't either, Richard. Yeah, unfortunately, your microphone or your computer is uh, really distorting your audio. I'm not sure why. 
It could be a lot of things, unfortunately. Um, maybe, you email could, us. maybe you could email us and then we could bring it up next time, do the question. Uh, could you, ret uh, could you try to reduce the volume a little bit? Maybe that helps. Yeah. And just re-ask your question. Uh, can you hear me now? A little better, but little better. Uh, reduce the volume more, if you can. How about right now? Yeah, that's better. Okay, well, just real quick, I was just wondering if the client can learn them without knowing what the reward means. Like, what, what, what of the tone of the um, yes. individual is a reward? Yes, they can. They absolutely can. Um, and that's the whole point of um, involuntary learning. You can learn massive amounts of information without being aware that you're learning it. In fact, we all do it all the time. Children do it more than adults. And one of the reasons that children um, are so adept and so quick is that uh, at that age, involuntary learning dominates their process and they don't have a well-developed frontal lobe. So that doesn't interfere with the learning. And the classic case of that, which I learned, which I saw, you know, in, doing neurofeedback was a real explication of all of my teacher's <laughs> explanations of operant conditioning. I was watching it, real examples of it in real time, that, and how it's applied, and it was mind boggling. Um, but, you know, the classic example is the um, adult who comes in and sits down and says, oh, okay. I'm going to do neurofeedback and I'm going to do this game. I'm going to make this rocket ship move across the screen or I'm going to make the bowl fill up with little marbles on the screen. And they focus and they squint and they grit their teeth, which of course increases artifact and reduces efficiency of the neurofeedback. Then you try to get them to relax and then they try strategies. This is what most people do and it makes sense. They try all these different strategies. If I think of this, will it work? If I think of that, will it work? If I breathe this way, will it work? If I move my hand to the right, if I sit a little bit leaning to the right, will it work? And sometimes what they're doing is they're making it work because they're introducing EMG, which is influencing the spectral display or they're got so much body movement, it's changing the spectral display, and it's increasing beta or alpha through artifact. So really what they're doing is they're conditioning themselves um, based on artifact feedback. And you're there trying to get them to say, no, calm, no, let's relax. No, try not to move. No, you don't have to think of anything. Well, and then they come down, well, how do I do this if I don't have a strategy? And then you try to explain, well, you just watch the screen and listen to the tone and um, just keep focusing on that. It's kind of like waiting for a train or a bus. And if you, they get that, they go, oh, okay. And, and then they try and then it starts to work. And you may be, in the old days, you could be two, three, even five sessions in with some people and you're still fighting this battle. Meanwhile, their kid, their child comes in for attention deficit, sits down and you say, okay, I want you to fill that, that jar up with marbles, just focus on it. You'll notice that if, if, you, if you just focus just right, you'll start getting marbles and the kids suddenly within minutes are producing marbles and you can see their training. Um, and it's obvious what's going on here. You don't need research to prove it, although some people bizarrely think you still need to. Um, and uh, yeah, right first session, they're training really well. To a large portion of that's involuntary training. There's no strategy, there's no intent other than just to focus. But you can get even more involuntary and not even be aware of any effort. Um, and that is what Beer Bomber says is highly efficacious. So the conclusion here is that involuntary video is superior to voluntary game. It's visual, immediate, proportional, and involuntary. So I'm gonna explicate it, unpack that. And that's what you're doing. Now, just in case you wanna know where that research from Beer Bomber is, there it is, okay? So um, we elaborate on the critical role of the basal ganglia, which Barry Sturman said in the 70s, in skill learning, 
and his software is called skill, by the way, and neurofeedback and clarify that brain self-regulation need not be an explicit and conscious process as often mistakenly held. Now you can get this article. It's I have this article posted on New Mind Journal. If you want to go up there and and um, register for the library, you can access this article and read it yourself and satisfy any questions you have. We don't have time to review it all. This is what just came out recently, and um, this is a really cool article. I was really impressed. This is 2021, this year. Um, it's an N of 113. Well, statistically, 90 to 95 is the breakpoint where you really get good validity and reliability out of a sample size. Uh, don't take my word for it. Google it. Look in your book on statistics. Um, and this research used random assignment. And what they did, and this is kind of confusing, but I think it's worth trying to focus on. We can come back to it again um, in another Lunch and Learn. They had three groups. They had one group that got to select what kind of reinforcement they want. Do you want a game? Do you want to listen to, to music? Do you want to look at a video? Unfortunately for them, but fortunately for us, everybody in group A chose video. And then they had them rate whether they thought they hated video was a great way to, to, to do this or a crummy way. Did they like the video? Did they enjoy the experience or was it not enjoyable? And then they had another group where they just assigned them a game. And the game was, you know, fill the marbles up in the empty jar. And you had to focus, and it was voluntary, and it was dichotomous. So, um, and then they, they got to rate whether they thought it was fun to do or not do. And then they took a sham group, and they let them make the same choice, and uh, gave them sham feedback, and then asked them how much they liked it or didn't like what they were doing. And then they did post measures, and this line here is the post measure. So you can see group A is involuntary neurofeedback and proportional and video. Group B is voluntary neurofeedback and dichotomous and a game. So we're pitting video against game and then sham. And then look at the outcome. The people who liked their video, um, it made a very significant difference in their training, and they were training SMR up. They ended up with higher SMR at the end of the session. They proved this in one session across all subjects. So they proved that one session of neurofeedback training can alter your EEG pattern. And it was like, well, duh, that's what the whole field's about. But there's still people out there arguing that who've never done neurofeedback and never been involved in clinical neurofeedback training and are just doing it from a theoretical investigatory perspective without even knowing what they're doing when they're setting up the designs because they, they don't know what they're doing. Um, people who didn't like their video made minor changes, but they weren't statistically significant. That's pretty amazing right there. That tells you that you need somebody to like their video when you give them a choice to some degree, they have to have some interest in it. Um, it's not black and white though. People who, whether they liked the, the game or not, there was no difference statistically. Now, the people who kind of liked the game and thought it was kind of cool, they had minor improvement, but not statistically significant. If we go down to the sham group, there was no different either way. So you need to have neurofeedback plus a high rating to get a significant difference. Okay, if it was only the rating that was critical, the authors point out, then assigned high readers should have done well in both group A and group B, and they didn't. So the conclusion, which they didn't jump on, but I did based on their research, they seem to have missed this point, but that's probably because they're not seasoned clinicians, is that um, video involuntary reinforcement is best. All right, any questions on that or comments? Did you get that? I tried to make it, it's very confusing. They didn't write it up very well. It took a lot of work to get the details, but that's because they really didn't know what they were looking for.
or what was going on, which is common with research in our field. We have a lot of people who do research in our field who are not clinicians, which is the worst combination you can have. All right, I've got making sure I've got everybody unmuted. Okay, so it sounds like people are kind of getting it. I know if you don't get it, you don't want to mention it because you don't want to look stupid. That's, I used to teach college, I know. It's called freshman disease. Okay. So further details that have shown up um, in some of the other research that I've been looking at as well, which was interesting. Um, in a study with healthy participants who had self-regulate the SMR, those subjects reported to use no specific strategy improved the best. So when we tell people, you know, if we're going to have them do voluntary stuff, to just do, to work on their intention and expectation, stay open to, to a change with intent rather than develop an explicit strategy is superior. Again, involuntary is superior because that. Uh, uh, Arnold et al. observed no difference in outcome in parent satisfaction after two to three weekly sessions although the parents preferred the schedule with three sessions a week, they must have lived close by. Um, so there's something Rob was asking about. So um, uh, they found no difference in outcome when investigating two versus three weekly sessions. So it's cheaper to do two. There's a guide for training. Uh, Bloom, 12, 2012, it was concluded that the learning is ongoing and learning success cannot be predicted from the performance during the sessions. What Bloom is pointing out there is that you can have good days and bad days, but the learning is ongoing. And well, that's the nature of learning. That's why we call it the learning curve. So that shouldn't be a surprise if you know learning theory and operant conditioning theory. That should be a given. As mentioned above, um, According to follow-up studies, uh, after slow cortical potential feedback in epilepsy and ADHD, patients not only continue to improve clinically after the end of treatment, self-regulation of the brain was improved or sustained. That's Strel 2014. Strel is a very thorough investigator and one of the better um, uh, people who does meta-analysis out there. She's like Martin Orens. She really got, knows what she's doing. Um, and uh, so you can be confident, based on the research we have so far, that people continue to improve and to sustain their advantages and improve. It may be concluded that learning does not stop with the last session. By using the self-regulation skill in everyday life skill, learning, patients are being reinforced to be less hyperactive impulsive and inattentive. And that's how human beings are. That's how children are. If they learn a skill that works, they will deploy it consistently regardless of punishment. You can't punish them out of the skill, something that a lot of parents don't understand. Um, uh, but I think Putin understands because he's trying to, <laughs> it doesn't work for him. This in turn consolidates the behavior while unfavorable brain activity is being extinguished. So we have a mechanism of action. It's consolidating because it's a superior, more satisfying response. Uh, the scale is used automatically wherever it is needed. In the end, it can be assumed that the functioning of the brain has changed, and then you don't have to assume that. You can see it in the brain map, and we've established at New Mind that on average, you should be seeing um, you know, 30, 35% change if they're training well overall. Let's look at schedules, reinforcement schedules, and ratio strain. And we're almost at the end of this. Um, ratio strain is a very important concept in behavior modification. I can remember even in my undergraduate class, they beat us over the head with this concept until I never forgot it. And then when I got started doing neurofeedback, I went, oh my God, there it is in real life, exactly as they explained it, in all the details. I went back to my book, opened it up, and read all about it make sure I understood it. So in operant conditioning, we don't have time for a course, but you set up reinforcement schedules, whether it's animal or people, and there's different ways you can schedule in research to come to different conclusions. And it's very important 
to have the right schedule to get optimal learning. And if you don't get enough reinforcement in a given time period, what begins to happen is you stop learning and in a sense you unlearn. We call that extinction operant theory. So you begin to learn the opposite of what you thought you were learning. Uh, so you have to have just the right amount of um, reinforcement all the time to maintain a learning schedule to learn to do something. That's fundamental. So when you hear people say, oh, automatic artifacting, it violates uh, behavior mod, I'd like to know where, I'd like to see the argument, I'd like to see the citations and the research because I can't find it. What I find is that you have to avoid ratio strain. And so if you're doing uh, uh, some kinds of training, you can get away without having op automatic thresholding. But if you try to do other kinds of training, you're not gonna get very far without auto thresholding or at least sitting there and adjusting it on the fly. And these researchers, I'm so I'm citing two recent, 2020 and 2019, two recent researchers doing excellent research on control group designs who were forced in the process because they didn't know better because they weren't clinicians, as far as I can tell. They were forced to observe their subjects and change the thresholds periodically in order to maintain a decent reinforcement schedule. And they acknowledged that. Empirically, they could not have pulled these experiments off unless they did that. And that's consistent with the operant conditioning theory. So the need for auto artifact is empirically confirmed unless you have somebody there who's managing the thresholds in real time. Now, there are conditions where you can get away without doing that. If you're training beta to theta ratios, which was very big early on in neurofeedback, those ratios don't change that much. So if you're using a, a ratio, uh, a threshold for that ratio, mm, a lot of times you can get away with it. But if you're trying to train alpha, which I was doing a lot of back in those days, different alpha frequencies and monitoring them, um, I had to, because I was doing a lot of peak performance stuff, I had to constantly change um, the uh, um, thresholds, otherwise there was no tone. They would sit there for five minutes without a tone because the threshold was set. And I said, we're in extinction. So I have to change the threshold to improve the schedule so they don't go into extinction from ratio strain. And I did that constantly all the time. And I kept hearing this other stuff about, no, you've got to have a, a steady threshold. I said, well, that can work under certain circumstances, but in general, it violates operant conditioning theory. You have, so um, it's not about thresholding. It's really not, is auto thresholding better than manual thresholding? What it's about is, are you paying attention to the fact that they're getting scheduled reinforcement at a good rate? If you don't know how to do that, then you better just use auto thresholding. Now with involuntary feedback, if you um, have to make a big deal by, um, shifting the threshold um, or you leave them extinguishing, they become aware that they're extinguishing. In other words, I'm not hearing a tone, I'm not seeing something, something's wrong, I'm not doing well, I'm doing it wrong. And they attribute it, particularly people with mental health problems, will in attribute it to themselves. Now, if they're borderline, they'll attribute it to you, but a personality disorder, but generally most people attribute it to themselves, particularly if they have depressive disorders. You know, I'm no good here, proves again, I can't do even do neurofeedback right. Now you better change that threshold, um, but they're gonna be aware, it becomes voluntary at that point. If you're doing video training, you don't want them to ever know what's going on. If that's the case, then you need auto thresholding. So there you have it, my arguments, my research, and why we do it the way we do at NewMind. I was aware of a lot of this research over the years, but this one piece of research really brought a great place to bring it all together. 
And uh, this is also posted. It's up on the library at New Mind Journal if you want to actually read the research itself. I know most clinicians, uh, they're not built that way. You know, when you get a PhD, they make you do it so much you want to cry and they they strip your breaks and you're, you'll sit in research for days on end, even though you can't learn anything after 16 hours. Uh, and so it becomes second nature, but it's painful if you, if it's not something you're really kind of inclined towards, it's, you know, it's like math. You know, most of us don't want to learn advanced calculus. It's just not in our game plan. Um, so here it is laid out in a very basic way, and hopefully it makes sense to you. If not, we're doing a video of this. You can review that. And then this research is available on the New Mind Journal Library. So check it out. Along with John Hummer's great article on trying to get neurofeedback into the VA. And Chris Brancier's really interesting article on photic. OK, so that's my yammer for the day. Anybody? A quick question, Richard. Uh, ratio strain is referring to insufficient reinforcement? Yes. Okay. It's okay. it's it, uh, it's it's your schedule is is um schedule okay. is 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 set up such that the uh, organism re receiving reinforcement is not getting enough reinforcement to result in um uh, in learning conditioning of the operant yeah and so then that's basically what they mean by that is they're not learning anything so what you're trying to teach them is um they're not learning and in fact they may be counter learning that they shouldn't do certain things or uh, uh, learning that doing what they're doing is useless so I'm focusing I'm focusing and nothing's happening so I'm wrong I'm useless this is not working I don't care now I'm getting really upset um, now I'm angry at the therapist now I'm angry at my wife or my husband for sending here spending this money um, uh, once that happens, an affect takes over. You're not going to learn anything. We know that from learning theory too. Oh, so sort of like giving up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Extinction. So it's interesting when when you made that comment about young young children who don't have a uh, developed frontal cortex and may not have all that negative talk. Maybe that also helps the the speed in which babies learn. Is yes, old. that's one of the reasons children. It's one of the not the only. Yeah, they don't they have that piece at all. So. Yeah. They just yeah, that's take really everything interesting. In. Thank you. They know right away. And babies, interestingly enough, there's some great research on babies. Babies are brilliant at manipulating parents and whole families. And they learn within the first year of life how to do it. And they're incredibly good at it. There's no conscious effort. There's no frontal lobes making a problem. It goes in, it comes out. And, you know, animals often are that way, too. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for this extremely informative and important uh, talk that you gave us today. You know, yes, really, and it helps you. As clinicians, we just train. We don't always understand exactly what we're, what's behind the scene. Yes, and you'll have people who challenge you. Oh, you guys are doing video. Oh, you can't do that. You've got to do uh, the, the fixed threshold. You have these extreme research people in the field who don't spend a lot of time training, apparently, or haven't read And not just, not just them. Patients all the time ask me because they feel like they're not Yesterday yes. I had something there, a scientist, and he goes, what, should I really not be trying? Like, it's hard for him to accept that. No, I really want you just to not be bothered with anything that's going on on the screen except enjoying what you're watching. Yeah, well, yeah. part of the problem is that if you're not a psychologist and you're not still looking at neurophysics and consciousness theory, I mean, then you just wrote a whole book on it. There's a lot of other people that, uh, great researchers in England and the U.S., um, it's one of my key areas of interest and study because I've been doing it since graduate school. Um, uh, because we've refused in science to acknowledge the existence of consciousness, but Wolfgang Pauli and Jung knew that, and so did all of the others. And you know, back then they knew that if they couldn't account for that, that their theory was incomplete. And that's the problem in physics. It's the hard problem. All of our science is incomplete because we can't measure consciousness. We can't explain it. We don't know what it is. You can't measure the taste of chocolate directly. Um, and you know this is part of rigid, overly rigid scientific thinking of scientism. And it, it happens a lot in engineering 
and people who apply physics and stuff, they don't really understand the history, you know, the ontology and the epistemology of science. And and your clients are the same way. They don't either. And they just make stuff up and make up stories in their head. And sometimes they tell you and sometimes they don't. And it's really important that you know what they're making up in their head. Otherwise, they could be interfering with the neurofeedback. Especially patients who define themselves by how they perform. And I yeah. see that with a lot of social struggles, you know, and then they apply to well, every part of their life. And then they come into neurofeedback and I'm telling them, no, 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 I don't, you know, let's try to change that way. You know, let's do it differently and hard. Right. Well, you try to find a piece of research out there where they acknowledge that and try to compensate for it. And if you don't, you're gonna get biased outcomes because you're not doing really good operant conditioning because you haven't taken these things into account. I see that all the time in the research. So you have people saying, well, neurofeedback doesn't work. And I look at their research and they said like, yeah, you didn't account for all of these variables. How, could, how can I accept your conclusion? I can't. But you know. Thank you. There's an invested interest in neurofeedback not working out there, just like there's an invested interest in not wanting consciousness to be acknowledged and that you have in, so if, if you have involuntary thoughts, if you learn involuntarily and a lot of your ideas and thoughts come from involuntary processing, that means you are no longer the person in charge. And this is a patriarchal culture that doesn't go over big. Right. That's scary. If you, Particularly if you're a guy or you're somebody who went into a discipline where you would be in charge, in control, like an engineer, you would know everything that's going on. I'm in charge of it all. I control it all, the horizontal and the vertical. Yeah, that's a really good point. I never thought of it like that. Uh, well, you right. have one like this on board here, Richard. Yes. There cannot be much in uh, uh, what resistance I came up back in the 1980s when I started to teach pilots how to pilot the pilot and started to talk about non-conscious behavior. Can you yes. imagine, you know, you talk to oh, control talk. freaks, right? Yes, <laughs> I don't know how you got anywhere. I talked to a board of, I was invited to go up to Canada and talk to the doctors who overview, who oversee all the pilots for the Canadian National Airline. And boy, I tell you, talk about a lot of cross arms and frowny faces when I was presenting them the data, they hated it. I sure know that. I sure know that. <laughs> <laughs> on, the other hand, great fun. on the other hand, if you get those people, because they have they have one thing which uh, theoretical academics uh, lack a little bit, they uh, are very well trained in consequent rational thinking. Good point, Martin. Good point. So uh, if you get them around and, uh, you know, kind of get them around the idea that we are you know, we know what we are doing. Um, we don't know yes. what we are doing. We can't. And if you can explain this rationally, why this is not possible, you get them around because they understand it rationally. That's a tough road to go, but... Uh, it is, uh, but it works. Yeah, oh, I believe you, Martin. It's one of the most important things you can learn in life. Yeah, why don't we learn it in kindergarten? It's not that complicated. Well, because in school, everything comes through effort, right? He's not well, trying it's what hard Connie enough. Mentioned. He's it's not what trying Connie. hard enough because he's not sleeping enough. Yeah. That's why he's not trying hard enough. <laughs> yeah, it's also, you know, people, people are really conditioned nowadays into buying existential rights by their awake performance. Yeah. And that's what Honey mentioned just now. That's, that's really a big... A uh, big issue we're up against. Mm -hmm. Also, with ourselves, I might like to mention. Oh, as yeah. Practitioners. Oh, it's, it's also tough. something where we go wrong. Right. Okay, well, we're up to the hour, past the hour. I didn't think this was going to take that long, but I always underestimate it when I start talking. My kids. I'm sorry I'm interrupting you, but it's about the study. I just had one. Um, um, something I wanted to mention, and I don't know if you agree with it, um, about the volunteering the side game, the sign game. Don't you think that maybe the sign game group had also non significant difference because it was a pressure in 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 um, performance 
as opposed to just watching something and trying to make something change with it in the same assigned game format. I think that's a great point. I think that's a great point. That's a good criticism, Yannick. And uh, then it should be tested in the future research. It's going to give them more sessions to see if if it changes with more sessions, uh, and and they don't feel and the, if then measure the amount of pressure they feel under to perform. That would be really cool. We'd learn more. Yeah, sorry, sorry to, um, to throw that in right now, but I think it was worth it. Oh, it's an important thing. That's you know, um, it's it's a valid question. Maybe the conclusions are wrong if we check that out. Okay. All right. All right. So thank you, everybody. Those of you who contributed, Martin and Yannick. Um, and uh, when we got Neuro at Night coming up on Monday, and uh, hopefully you've got you've gone on the listserv and see what's coming up. Rob will should be back with us by Monday. But maybe not. He sent me pictures of his house with all the furniture and stuff stacked up in piles <laughs> everywhere. Might take him a while to dig out. Um, so uh, hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Richard, thank you very much for once again a very structured presentation. I believe that is very helpful. Thank well, you very thank much. You, Mark. I'm glad to hear you found it helpful. All right, everybody, enjoy.